the definition of smart city, I think I'm going to hold off on. Uh, because it's one of the questions I'm going to ask you about. <clears throat> but before I do, I wanted to, in deference to my first two panels, who both wanted to terminate this panel, <laughs> <clears throat> I, I want to recap some of what you heard this morning, because I think in the rest of the remarks that we have about, about what smart city is or could be and the role of utilities in that idea, that concept, you'll hear many of the same things that I'll talk about that you've already heard. So let me first start with a recap. Uh, Ralph Izzo, I don't know if these guys are still here or not. <laughs> One of his key points was, that, let's take note of the value of networks and analytics. That was in, on his message points, right? Uh, Bob Stump, Bob I think is still here. Uh, interconnectedness of both the big and the small, a critical part of a utility's future. Uh, Representative Walters mentioned several times the importance of engagement, getting the education right, but engagement, engagement, engagement. Uh, Pedro Pizarro, several things. Tech, uh, technology is driving improvements to grid performance. Let's not lose sight of that. An array of customer choices as well. And one of the things as utilities we have to do is shift our mind. We have to have a mind shift about our role and the value of experimentation, he emphasized as well. Keep these in mind, because they're going to come back to haunt you in a moment. Susan Kennedy, uh, many, many good things here. One direction in our future, we're moving to a more distributed energy future. Bank on it. It's a certainty. Integration of resources is critical. Similar point you've heard before. Uh, leadership, critical success factor. Leadership in the utilities must be open to new ideas. And, and of course, she emphasized the importance of regulatory alignment for that. Uh, Jonathan Weisgall, listening and responding to customers. If we don't, others will. Hmm. Chris Black, customer needs are changing. Right? Technology is in enabling an orchestration for the energy system to optimize. Here again, technology enables shift. One of the things you might hear in all of those, though, is that each of them are a reflection about what, our, what we can do. It's inward looking right? in response to what's happening around us. Smart cities, in part, is a concept that says, hmm, what more could happen if we took what we have and tried to do something else with it beyond just what is obvious to us, safe and reliable, fair-priced energy delivery? Uh, my colleague, Russ, wasn't able to join us today, unless that's him walking in. No. <clears throat> uh, he is in the hotel. Hopefully, he'll be up and around a little later, and you'll get a chance to meet him. Uh, but he's one of the most credentialed people I've met on the topic of smart cities. So if you do get a chance or you have questions after this event, I'd encourage you to track him down, because he's ITRON's point person globally on this topic. He's working and seeing what's happening all over the world about this, this idea of a smart city, which is really just taking everything we just talked about, everything we heard in the last two panels, and saying, what would happen? What's the role of the electric industry as a collaborator in helping enable a different level of performance beyond energy into the way our communities perform? Smart cities actually represent a wonderful opportunity for our industry to accomplish a couple of things. And one of those is to refresh the role and the relevance that we have to the communities we serve. Right? Refresh the role and relevance we have and do that in a way that allows us to curate, to orchestrate, to curate a more prosperous future, a new wave of prosperity for those communities. And I'll, I'll share that in three lenses, one of those being a historic perspective on how our industry has sort of evolved, uh, some future facts, some trends that shape our risks and rewards, and I'll also probably end then on uh, a model that we might mimic that helps inform how we, how we think about this, the mind shift question. About five years ago or so, I read an article in the McKinsey Quarterly and it was on a, an, or an effort in uh, Portugal called Plan It, Plan IT. And it was an effort to try to figure out how to use technology to integrate the and improve, integrate technologies to improve the performance of a city, a whole city. They were only doing a couple of things, like water and energy, uh, but the idea of it was really grand. And it was very large and expansive. There were other communities around the world at that time trying to do the same thing, Mazdar City, Songdo, South Korea. But just a handful, there weren't very many. Today, there are hundreds. So how do we leverage that? How do we think about our role in that? 
So that's what got me thinking about those things and our company is starting to wonder, well, gee, we've just had some phenomenal success at establishing a smart grid city in Pullman, Washington. And we were enabled by that in part because of the stimulus uh, programs that many of you are familiar with. Uh, but we got through that and, and it works. It's phenomenal. <laughs> the transactive signals, the whole nine yards, the smarter circuits, the more efficient response that we have, the efficiency on the system. But it begs a question. If it works so well, is it, what's the next experiment we might try? And we said, well, maybe, maybe it has to do with not just what we can do with technology for us, but how what we're going to do anyway what we're going to do anyway, upgrading the system and modernizing the grid, how that might be put to use for extra value. So we tackled this in a three-phase approach. Uh, the first phase was simply to ask, gee, can we do this technically to actually use our system to enable somebody to do a non-energy function on it? Uh, what would be the constraints, either policy, regulatory, or otherwise? And even if we did it, would anybody care? And you know, we found a surprising thing. We ran a charrette, an invitation with researchers from our land-grant university, and we asked them, if you, you had a, an experimental zone where you could get any data, sense any data, anywhere, anytime, would that, would that be interesting to you? What would you study? Open-ended question. And we have page after page after page of ideas, 40% of which are health-related. Not about energy. But the question would be, well, we're going to put in a communication system anyway that has to be secure by definition, right? Could it be designed in a way that would allow others to access it? That was the question. The second phase of the work was to look at that and say, okay, well, if we're going to do that, what are the design criteria? What must the system do in order to perform well? And it won't be any surprise to you about the critical success factors. It must be secure. Got to be secure, right? It has to function seamlessly for all purposes. We have to stack the response depending on what happens in the system so that energy customers are still served in the proper way. We're going to have much more data and how that data is shared and governed is also going to be an important consideration. So phase three is where we're at now, which is to say, okay, we understand what people need from it. How do we build it? What's the true architecture of the technical system? And that's in progress today. We've not built it yet. But I can tell you along the way, we started with five people, and today we have more than 200 people, and we've attracted the likes of the university, the city, utility, and ITRON, Cisco, Qualcomm, Bosch, companies that would never pay a lick of attention to Spokane, Washington, because there wasn't anything special about it until now. Is there a role for us? And I'm not here to say, yes, go do it, but I am here to say, yes, you should be experimenting. Because if you don't, others will. So we have this service that we provide, but the role and responsibility as we are perceived as an industry by others has been shrinking. It's under duress. And it's because, in part, we stand for the thing that we do, not the things that we enable. Well, maybe it's time to change that. Smart Cities gives us a chance to rethink and refresh and reimagine the role that we play as an industry in service to communities to empower people to do great things. That's amazing. And that's what our services do anyway. But we get caught up in not really pushing that envelope, not really experimenting about that future. And the consequence of that is what we harvest. That we're not always at the table. That we're not always thought of as an enabling infrastructure, and yet we are. The question still hangs in the balance. What more could our infrastructure do? We're going to spend billions, perhaps a trillion dollars in the next 10 years. Could I tweak it just a little bit to make it more versatile? There's the question. What more could we do if we chose? What more could we do if we led, as opposed to stood by and waited? And that brings us to this question, or this idea of maybe there's somebody we can mimic. Not mimic precisely, because <laughs> I'm going to use Amazon as the example. But here's something that Amazon did. Imagine you're Jeff Bezos, 
and you've, you've taken technology that enabled a way to change how books, physical books, are distributed. And then your competitors do the same thing, and, and that's the end of it. And, and now you're going to defend what you've done and not do anything else? No. <laughs> he took the same distribution system that he'd built and said, let's put more things through it. So now it's any product, anywhere, anytime. And he didn't stop there. He could have resisted electronic books because he's got a whole system distributing real books, tangible books. But he didn't. He embraced it as an added product that some customers wanted, but others did not. Think of what you heard about solar. Hmm. And he changed the world, and he enabled it with Kindle. But there's one more. All of that took a, ser a server farms like you can't believe. And he could have said, that's mine. I'm not going to share it with anybody. Think about our distribution systems, Elect electric energy only. He said, no, I'm going to share it, even with my competitors. And that became Amazon Web Services. So in every one of those examples, we have a story of an asset base that was levered and re-levered and levered again through integration and optimization. Well, what are the assets that we have? And I'll submit to you that we have all the resources we need. The assets, the allies, the thought leaders, the decision makers, the resources necessary to actually help our communities achieve more than they otherwise would, if we lead. If we lead. And if we do, we will refresh the role and relevance of our industry to those we serve, and we'll curate a new wave of prosperity. And I think that would be a pretty good thing. Let me tie this back to smart, smart cities a little bit and, and talk about the value of data in the same way. When, uh, when we looked at what other cities in the world are doing with this attempt at integrating technologies, almost all of them are looking at layering a discrete uh, set of sensors for a discrete set of activities. So I want to optimize my water system, I want to optimize my parking system, I want to optimize my lighting, or my gas or electric system. Uh, what we're trying to do in our experimental zone in Spokane is think big, but start small and learn quickly. And the way we're doing that in part is to say, look, in this experimental zone, we'll, we're going to try and architect this for really simple access. But the key reason we've attracted some of the other outside interest is because we said, if you're a participant here, there's, there's one rule you're going to have to agree to. And, and uh, appropriately, your data needs to be centralized and available to anybody else that participates in the experimental zone. So what that enables is these kinds of curious questions to be asked and answered. Because today, the data sets in silos. But in this experimental zone, each of the layers, which each participant will be striving to get insight about their layer, there will also be the opportunity to drill through the layers. And that's the thing that's distinct in Spokane that nobody else has proposed to do that, to make the information available so that there is a chance for fresh discovery, a chance for finding relationships that today can't be found because the data isn't shared.